Amen. He is the King. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, just in case you weren't aware, most of you do, that uh, Brother Joe and Phil and Bill and Charity and Christy and Camille's mom had their, they had the uh, funeral service in San Angelo on Friday. Of course, last Sunday we had the memorial here. And Brother Joe wanted me to mention on his behalf and on the family's behalf to thank you for your prayers and calls and texts and uh, just your love and encouragement during this time. It means so much to him and, and the family and also for the meal that uh, everyone uh, contributed to for the family after the memorial service. He wants me to say thank you from the bottom of his heart to you. Uh, Believers Fellowship always is there for the pastors and for the members and you're just always giving and loving. So he wanted me to give you his love and tell you thank you so much for all of that you've done for him. Well, this morning uh, we want to talk about a little story. There was a guy who was driving his little Yugo around town and he happens to pull up at a red light and lo and behold, there's a Rolls Royce. And so he pulls down the window of his Yugo and motions for the Rolls Royce driver to pull down his window and says, hey buddy, I, I like that car. Said, you, you, do you have a phone in it? He said, yeah, of course I do. He said, I have a phone in my Yugo. He said, well, do you have a refrigerator in there? Said, I got a refrigerator in my Yugo. He said, yeah, I got a refrigerator. He said, well, do you have a television in that Rolls? I have a television in my Yugo. He said, of course I have a television. This is a Rolls Royce. This is the finest luxury car in the world. Of course I got a TV. He said, well, you'd have a, he said, well, do you have a bed? He said, I have a bed in the back of my Yugo. Oh, the guy was frustrated. Oh, he couldn't stand it anymore because he didn't have one. And he didn't even answer. He just drove away from the red light. He drove straight to the Rolls Royce dealer and $10,000 later, he had him a bed in the back of his Rolls Royce. And so now his goal is to find that guy that you go and rub it in. And so, man, he drove and he drove and he drove and he drove. And finally, he finds the guy in the Yugo in an abandoned parking lot. And he pulls up to him and he knows the windows are all fogged up. And he doesn't know if he's in there or not. And so he's knocking on the door of that Yugo and he's knocking, knocking, knocking. Pretty soon the window rolls down and the guy sticks out his head with wet hair and wet head. And he looks over at him and the guy says, I've got a bed now in my Rolls Royce, $10,000 bed. There, take that. Guy said, you got me out of the shower to tell me that? <laughs> See, what we want in life sometimes just a little further away and we never get it, do we? We think all of our pursuits, all of our endeavors are gonna bring us happiness because we can get one more thing or one more deal and there's somebody else got something just a little bit better, makes our what we have just seem nothing. And as we make our pursuits for 2015, we ought not be pursuing one more thing that somebody else doesn't have. We need to make our pursuits more holy and righteous than that. And that should be our surrender to the Lord. And so this morning, the question is, are you surrendering or hindering your life? Because this morning, I'd hasten to say that our actions are doing one of those two. They're either surrendering to the Lord are they hindering our life because there's really not another option? You know, I've always been amazed and I know, I don't know in the mind of God, the raising of hands that we do when we worship. Some of us choose to raise our hands when we worship, some don't. It doesn't matter, it matters where your heart is. But I've often thought that what a beautiful picture that when police and the old west and anybody else wants you to surrender, they say, come out with your hands up. What a beautiful picture of surrender and that when we worship and praise his name that maybe that's the picture. I surrender to the Lord. This morning we will look at a few things of really what surrender is. We find this in a well-known passage in Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, which most people know very well. The first thing you have to surrender is to even become a Christian is surrender your soul. The Bible says, I urge you, which many believe to be one of the most tender pleas in the whole Bible, this one phrase, I urge you. 
Thomas Constable said, it is the most tender plea in the entire Bible. It's such, if you study just that word urge, Paul said, man, please, I beg of you. It's not a command in this, but it is a command once he starts saying it. But before he says the command, he just urges them. And who does he urge? The brethren, Christians. By the mercies of God, because that's the only way we got saved anyway, by God's mercy. Mercy is not giving us what we deserved, because if we des got what we deserved, we'd be found guilty by God. Wouldn't take much of a jury to find us guilty, because if you committed one sin, you're guilty. And so therefore, we're guilty. We wouldn't have any defense. We'd just go straight to hell because we were convicted of one sin, because if you've sinned once, you've sinned enough to not be perfect in God's eyes. But God, in his loving kindness and mercy, forgave us. He, he didn't give us what we deserved. He gave us grace through Christ, his death on the cross, his sacrificial death, that pardon of our sin. We were pardoned, forgiven of every sin that we had ever committed, if we come to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Now, a lot of people, they know about Jesus and they know about Jesus' death on the cross. And they have this concept that God, through Christ, forgave everybody. So everybody's saved. I mean, he's, he pardoned sins. He died for all the sins of the world. This is true, but only those that receive his pardon. Only those who by faith put their trust and faith and commit their life to him are saved. It's not the whole world gets saved just because Jesus died on the cross. Back in 1830, a man named George Wilson, who had been a, convicted of murder and was sentenced to be hanged, President Andrew Jackson, the president at that time, pardoned George Wilson. And George Wilson did something that had never been done before at that time a quite amazing thing, he refused the pardon. And the U.S. government had no idea what to do. Do we make him go free? Do we make him leave? He's been pardoned by the President of the United States. They were so baffled that this case made it all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. For the, the Supreme Court to rule, what do we do? And here was what they decided and here was the quote by Chief Justice Marshall in 1830. Quote, a pardon is a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson will, must be hanged. And he was because a pardon is only a pardon if you receive it according to the Supreme Court of the United States and according to God's word. It's a pardon, but it's, if it's not personally received, it is no longer a pardon. So if we never have surrendered our souls, the surrender process cannot continue anymore. That's the first step. A lot of people miss the first step. A lot of people have kind of snuck in stealth through the church and felt like, well, I'm in here now, I'm saved. Well, only saved is that you've given your life to Christ and surrendered your soul. The Bible talks about, you know, what if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? <laughs> what a life it is to surrender your soul for hell. But this is talking about surrendering your soul to Christ so that you can gain heaven. Have you surrendered your soul? Have you had that pardon personally in your life? Paul said, I urge you, brethren, those who had already surrendered their soul to Christ in salvation. The second thing is to surrender your body. Paul goes on to say to present your bodies a living, praise the Lord, not a dead sacrifice, but a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. He starts out with the word present, which in the Greek that can be translated present or also surrender. Surrender your bodies. 
In other words, here's my body. I've already surrendered my soul and salvation. Now I'm still in my body and my body craves a lot of sinful things that it wants. It wants to behave a certain way. I've got to give that to Christ because my body, according to the scripture, is not my own. I've been bought with a price. So therefore, what I do with my body is not my own choice. I don't say, well, I think I feel like doing this or I feel like doing that. No, my body is supposed to be surrendered to the Lord. Now back then, they knew what sacrifices were, but all the sacrifices before this were dead sacrifices. <laughs> to be a sacrifice, you had to die. But the Lord allows us to live and continue to sacrifice what we want for what God wants because that's the key. Our dreams, our desires, we sacrifice that to the Lord and we're to die daily. Don't be like the man said, you know, I try to die daily, but Satan keeps resuscitating me. That's what Satan wants. He don't want you to die. He'll keep giving you mouth to mouth and resuscitation because he wants you to not die to self. He wants self to rule, to make all your decisions. He don't want you to sacrifice your body. He'll do all he can to keep you from living or keep you living for self and not for God. Then he goes on, not only are you still living, but you do it holy. Now, holy, of course, means what you naturally think it means, without sin. But specifically, it has to do with setting something apart for a special purpose. That purpose being sinful, I mean, sinless and trying to, to live for Christ. Obviously, won't be completely sinless, but we will sin less. <laughs> but in that, we are set apart. For a purpose. Do you realize that? That your body is holy and it's set apart for God's purpose. God has a purpose for each of us. Now some people are going to die or they'll be on the rocking chair of the nursing home thinking, you know, I missed it. I missed it. But you didn't have to miss it because God has a purpose for each of us and in this purpose We'll discover it once we say, you know, this isn't my body. This is God's body. God, what do you want to do with it? Because this isn't for my purpose. It's for your purpose. You know, none of us in this room said, you know what I'm going to do one day? I'd like to be born. <laughs> that wasn't your call. All right, when I do born, I'm gonna, I want to be born in the United States of America. Or I'd like to live here. You know, we don't, all that stuff is beyond our control. But God, in his infinite wisdom, said you're going to be born one day. And when you are, you're to surrender your soul and then surrender your body to be used for my purpose. You know, he also says here that it's acceptable. Another way to look at that word acceptable, it could be translated pleasing. It's pleasing to God. When you sacrifice your body for God's purpose, that's pleasing to God. That's acceptable to God. And then he says the word spiritual, which is really the Greek word logikos, you can hear our word in there, logical. It's your logical service. It is your reasonable service. Why does he use that word reasonable? Listen, for Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to give his life when he had no sin and never done anything wrong, and he to give his life for me, it's only reasonable for you and I to serve him. That's only reasonable. Well, I don't know if I'm going to serve him or not. That's not reasonable. You haven't grasped, you've got to go back to point one. You haven't understood point one. It's by God's mercy and grace that we were personally saved. See, a lot of times people don't want to serve the Lord because it's not personal. Oh, he died for the whole world. Well, that's not quite what excites me like saying he did it for me. My sinfulness. <laughs> me. If I was the only one alive, he'd still done it for me. That kind of brings it home to say, you know what? My service is only logical or reasonable. You know, if I, let's say I was a multimillionaire. Let's say I had $10 million and I cashed it all in just enough for me to buy a little one bedroom apartment and have just enough to just barely get by on with bread and water. And all the rest of the millions of dollars I gave to you said, this is all yours. I'm just going to live like a pauper. Here, this is all for you. And then I said, oh yeah, is there a way you could come by and mow my yard once a week? 
Absolutely not. Oh, really? No, I'm way too busy. You just gave me a million dollars. I'm going to live it up. That's hard. I asked you to mow my yard. I just gave you all my money. And that's too much to ask. Wouldn't that be reasonable for me to ask you just to do that? Paul's saying, Jesus Christ, by God's mercy, forgave you and cleansed you and gave you life and health and a job, everything, and saved your soul. Isn't it reasonable that you would serve him when he gave you everything? He bankrupt heaven. And then he uses the word worship, which is the giving of our sacrifices. We call it even worship if here. Uh, the sacrifices of praise. We worship him in giving. We worship him in serving. It's our sacrifices of where we worship. Whether we sacrifice our money or our time or our energy or our praise, whatever sacrifices we make, we make it as unto God. That's worship. It's not just singing. And I know what people say, and I've said it before too, but it, isn't it a common vernacular to go home and say, you know, I got a lot out of that service. Maybe it should be this. You know, I left a lot at that service. Maybe that should be the judge. I left a lot there. I found somebody that needed prayer and I prayed for him. I, I checked on a brother who was discouraged and tried to encourage it. I left my offering, I left my praise, I left this, I left that. I didn't get anything out of it, I left it all. Praise God, that was a good service. <laughs> now we know we got out of it, that means it blessed our heart. But maybe we ought to start saying it's what we left. Paul said it's your reasonable service to leave your sacrifices and what you left. You know, David Livingston said this, Christians who offer a living sacrifice of themselves usually do not consider it to be a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice, what sacrifice? I didn't give my life for him. He gave his life for me. I hadn't done that much yet. And of course, once you do it, you can't brag about that because you're dead. So none of us have done that yet. But who knows the way the world's going, maybe we may be called to one day. But before that, we can give a living sacrifice for him by sacrificing or surrendering our body. But first of all, we gotta say it's not my body. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So if I don't own it and he owns it, then I deserve, he deserves my sacrifices unto him. And then we must surrender our mind not only our soul, not only our body, we've got to surrender our mind. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The first word he talks about is conformed. It's a pattern. It's a mold. Matter of fact, I like how Phillips translates it. He said, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. A lot of ladies have little uh, molds that you can make a cake in, a heart-shaped mold or a butterfly-shaped mold. And whatever the mold is, when you get through, that's what the cake is shaped like. You pour the batter so that the batter conforms to the mold so that when you take it out of the oven, it looks just like the mold. This world wants us to look, talk, dress, respond, reply, like them. And so the world is always squeezing you in to where you'll look just like them. That's what its goal is. But we can't be, we should not be conformed to this world. There was a candy camera deal. Many of you are familiar with that. Candy camera was a show when we grew up and what they did, it was staged. They had hidden cameras placed everywhere and everybody but usually one person who wasn't in on it was the victim. Everybody else knew about it, was part of the set and was part of the TV crew that was filming it. Well, the TV cameras were set up in an elevator 
And everybody in the elevator, you know how the elevator doors are like this? They were all facing this way when people walked in. You know how you're always facing this way when you're waiting on the elevator? So they were all facing that way. And so the guy goes in and he stands there and he sees everybody facing the wrong way. And so he waits a little bit and another person comes in and they come in facing that way. So eventually he turns around and faces that way too. He doesn't know why, but everybody else in the elevator is facing backwards. He just thinks, I guess I will too. Which part shows you part of the human psyche. I guess I don't want to be different. I mean, it's not reasonable, I guess, to face this way. And look how the world just gets everybody to turn the way they're turning. So successful. Can't be different. Won't be a weirdo. So we don't surrender. We don't surrender our mind. We start thinking the way they think. And then we think about, it's not an active verb, it's a passive verb here, which means something is being allowed to be done to us. So what the breakdown of this word is, is I'm allowing it to happen. It's being done to me and I'm just sitting there allowing it to happen. To let the world conform me to its mental state. And then the world here doesn't have to do with the globe or the dirt that makes up the universe. It has to do with the philosophy of life. When we grew up, there was a show called The Wild World of Sports. It was the world of sports. That means everything that was about sports dictated that show. The world of finance. What's that mean? Everything to do with finance. The world of politics. Everything to do with politics. That's what dictates their thinking. So the Bible's saying here, it's a philosophy, a mindset of life. Don't let the world's thoughts and how they make decisions and what's important in life and what you need to do to get ahead and everything that the world bombards us to through TV and movie and print and opinion, that's the world of how we ought to think. It's the way we thought probably really did before we got saved. But once we got saved, we should start transforming our minds to think totally different. The Bible says, so as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know who I am? I'm how I think. I mean, I'm, yes, I'm new in Christ and I'm a new creature, but basically everything about me is how I'm thinking all my decisions are based on how I'm thinking. My computer in my office has its, in its program, it has defaulted to the office printer. That means if I do nothing on a document except click print, the computer will automatically print to that printer. I have two other printers on my computer but it will not go to them because it's not defaulted to them. I have to go in there if I want to and manually unprogram, deprogram, correct, change the computer to say, look, we don't no longer want to default to that. We want to default to that. And that's the way it is for the Christian. Beside doing this, our brains will automatically default that way. Here's what I want to do. <laughs> Click. Here's what feels like right. Click. Here's what will make me feel good. Click. Here's the way I've always been doing it. Click. And you'll click that way till you draw your last click and die. Because you've always been clicking that way. But you got to go in there and say, we changing this up. Mr. Computer in there, you no longer the default there. We're going to find out what Jesus wants and we're going to click that way. To where I'm going to do that often enough to we're going to keep defaulting over that direction and make a new change. You know what I thought would be a great title for a Christian movie? Transformers. Or there already is a, there is a movie by that name. But that would be a great Christian title. Transformers. Because that's, that's us. We're the only ones that are transformed because we have a transformed brain. Because we think different, and therefore we are, can act different. And if you're not acting different, it's because you're not thinking different. 
You have to have that brain transformed. And since it's such an important point, I, I want to hit three things that have to happen, I believe, for us to have this transformed mind. What are they? First of all, we got to be spirit-filled. The Bible says, don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. The Bible says to the people at Ephesus, you know what being drunk is. A lot of them came from that type of background. What is it? You drink so much of alcohol that the alcohol controls you. That's why we call it under the influence. If you're caught DWI, you were driving under the influence of something else besides you, under the influence of the alcohol. You put so much alcohol in your system that it controlled you more than you control you. And the Bible says, don't do it that way, but let the Spirit so consume you, so fill you like alcohol used to, that you're under its control, His control, I should say, and not your own. You've got, we've got to say, Lord, fill me with your Spirit because in my flesh, I can't think right. But if I get drunk with you, so to speak, I let you so influence me, then you're going to be the one that changes my behavior because I'm under your influence instead of my own. Fill me, Lord, because I don't want to think these wrong thoughts. I want my mind controlled by you. Second one is know the word, hide it in your heart, and obey it. Tony Evans relates it to the referees on an NFL football team. Because that's really what it is. When you go to watch a football team play an NFL football team, there are three teams represented there. The home team, who's wearing a certain kind of uniform, a visitor team, who's wearing a certain kind of uniform, and the referee team, who's wearing a third kind of uniform. Three teams on the field. Now, unlike the other two teams, the referees have a total different objective. Their objective is to properly learn and obey, not the Bible, but the NFL Bible, which is the NFL playbook, the NFL referee book, which I looked at it online, it's 120 pages. I didn't read it, but I just wanted to see how long it was. They study that thing. And they don't say, well, it's too long to read. If you're going to be an NFL referee, you're going to study that thing or you're not going to play. You have to have at least 10 years experience to even get that far. You've got to study that book because it's only in what's in that book that counts. You can't be swayed one way or the other. Matter of fact, they won't even let you referee in a stadium that's in your hometown, lest you be persuaded to not go with the playbook. You may want to go with the home team book because you have to be non-objective in your calls. You can't go with the team that's behind and let that sway you. You can't go with what the spectators are yelling and screaming. Matter of fact, even on page six of the NFL playbook, it says this, spectators are blinded by their allegiance to their teams and they do not view the action objectively. That's in the playbook to the referees to study. Why? You no good for nothing, idiot! Because they're going to be screaming that kind of stuff at the home deal. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll change the call. Touchdown. I don't want to be called an idiot anymore. So they put that in there. They're not objective. They're kind of blinded spectators are. And you know you've done that. You've seen a call. Those that, 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 that was a touchdown. And, you know, and you've seen the other team do exactly that and you didn't say a word. You thought that was a good call when he did it on the other side. You know we do that. We're not objective. But a referee has to be objective because a referee has to learn. I cannot seek to please that team, that team, the spectators. I am here for one reason, to please the NFL and the commissioner, and that's it. As long as the NFL and the commissioner are pleased with my behavior, I don't care who yells, hollers, screams, and says I made bad calls, as long as 
the NFL says I'm making a good call. And that's the way it is for us. If our mind is gonna be transformed, we have to say, it doesn't matter what everybody else is hollering, I've gotta go with what the rule book says. And even if it contradicts what I think, you read that and you think, I don't really agree with that. Overruled. <laughs> read Judges. Those people were in chaos. Read the book of Judges. Those people were messed up. Twice it says in the book of Judges, and they did what was pleasing in their own eyes. They did what was right in their own eyes. Twice it says that. That was where they messed up. They didn't read the rule book and say, here's what we've got to do by faith. Here's what we've got to do even if we have to surrender. Here's what we've got to do even if they don't like it. They said, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to do what pleases us. And what doesn't please us, we're not going to do. And that doesn't work. Even if an NFL referee is challenged, how do they make up their mind? NFL playbook. They look at it one more time and it's always judged on what the playbook says. If we're going to have our minds changed, we've got to obey the word. And you know what? We also have to hide it in our heart. Have you ever seen an NFL re referee out there with his playbook? <laughs> Hold on, stop! <laughs> Holding! <laughs> they don't run around with their playbook, do they? No. They kind of must have a verse I bet they memorize. Thy playbook have I hidden thy heart that I might not sin against the NFL. Because <laughs> David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You won't have this thing right with you, maybe a copy as you're about to make a decision. You gotta know it well enough to hide it in your heart. So you run out there and you don't need to refer back to it. You need to keep reading it, studying it, but you're hiding it in your heart. That's the only way to transform your mind. And then the last thing is we've got to forget the past. Paul said, one thing I do. I don't know about you. If I hear Paul say, one thing I do, I'm going to focus on that. If Paul has one focus, what's your focus, Paul? Forgetting those things which lie behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. If you've got mistakes, if you've got a past, you've got some things you'd rather just forget about, put them behind you. Because you can't do a thing about them right now. You can worry about them, fret about them, wish you wouldn't have done them, wish you'd have come to doing something different. We all have. You've got to put them behind you because if you let your past dictate your present, it'll ruin your future. I'm going to say that again. I didn't know how that was going to come out. If you let your past dictate your present, it'll ruin your future. It'll ruin your present too. If you want to learn how that is illustratively, from the time you leave the church today till this time tomorrow, Walk looking back over your shoulder the rest of the day and drive that way too. Don't look forward for the rest of the day. Look back. You're going to trip, fall, bruise, have wrecks. It's going to be terrible because you're looking back. You've got to look forward. What God has ahead of us because our thinking gets so messed up because of our past. In Christ, it's done. If you've asked God to forgive you, it's forgiven. And we can move forward in Christ and not have to worry about the past and what it may or may not have done to mess us up. And then Paul wraps up with this one. You gotta surrender your will. Not only your soul, not only your body, not only your mind, now it's time to surrender your will. So that you may prove what the will of God is. What kind of will? That which is good, acceptable and perfect. A lot of people say, Brother Tim, I just can't find the will of God. I just can't find the will of God, what God's will is for my life, for my decisions. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you surrendered your soul? Have you surrendered your mind? Have you surrendered your body? Well, no, Brother Tim, but I just can't figure out the will of God for my life. Duh. This one comes forth. And you wonder why Christians never find the will of God. Paul didn't list it first. He listed it fourth. Once a person surrenders their soul, and then they surrender their body, and then they surrender their mind, they just walking in the will of God. 
They're finding God's will all the time. It's just evident because their brain's been transformed, their body's surrendered, their soul's surrendered, so they just don't have to do a lot of searching. They're just walking right in it. It comes what I call nat or supernaturally. Right down that road of those three things. Because we've surrendered all the rest. You know what Adrian Rogers said? God would choose something for you that you would choose for yourself if you had enough sense to choose it. God would choose for you what you'd choose for yourself if we had enough sense to choose it. But we don't. And you know why we don't? Because we don't know the future. If you knew the future, even two months from now, well, how that would change your decisions. Or if you knew what it was 10 years from now, or 100 years from now, or whatever, if you knew the future, that'd sure help you with your decisions. Guess what? God's already there. He's the I am. He's already in the future. He's in the present. He's in the past. He's all everywhere all at once. He can sure help me in my decisions when I find out what his will is. George Mueller said there came a day when I died, died to the praise and criticism of men, died to everything except the will of God for my life. I'm not worried about people's criticism. I'm not worried about their praise. What's God's will? See, that's a transformed brain. That's a transformed mind that says, you know what? Let's find out what God wants. And whatever he wants, that's what I want. And you know, you may be saying, Brother Tim, I've been surrendering. I've, been, I've surrendered my soul. I've surrendered my body. I've surrendered my mind. But Brother Tim, right now what I'm seeing in my life doesn't look like good. It doesn't look acceptable. It doesn't look perfect. Matter of fact, it looks kind of bad. And I am doing those things. There was a man once who had a dream. And in that dream, he was talking to God. And he said, God... Where are you in my life? I've surrendered my soul. I've surrendered my mind. I've surrendered my will. I've surrendered everything. And everything around me doesn't look good. Where are you? And God said to him in that dream, what do you have around you? He, looked, he said, well, I have a fern plant over here and I got a bamboo tree over here. He said, remember when you planted them both? He said, when you planted that fern, immediately it started growing and it grew a little bit every day till today, a year later or five years later, it's a foot tall. You saw the growth steady. He said, but remember when you planted that bamboo tree? He said, year one, you saw no growth. Year two, you saw no growth. Year three, no growth. Year four, no growth. Year five, no growth. But today that tree is so tall, you could climb up into it and it towers above you. He said, while I was planting and growing, the Lord said, that tree, those five years, I was having the roots grow and you couldn't see them. And they went further and further and further down because I knew how tall I wanted that tree to grow and I made its foundation prepared so that it could handle it to grow to great heights. If you're living your life and you're committed to Christ and you're not seeing God move maybe for years in this situation, you say, Lord, where are you? God's been growing the roots to prepare you for great heights. And you've got to keep holding on. And if you want great heights, you just simply by faith saying, God, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look acceptable. It doesn't look perfect. But Lord, I know your will is true and I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna keep surrendering all that I have because by you doing this, the up must be way up. More than that fern, you're getting me prepared for a great blessing because of all the depth that I can't see. Keep surrendering to the Lord. Because he, even when it's unseen, he's still working. Maybe even preparing you that foundation for a great blessing that you can't handle until you have a good foundation. Or else you may misuse it or abuse it or not be able to handle it.
keep surrendering, even when you can't see it. Because for God, it's always good when He does it. It's always acceptable or pleasing to Him, and it's always going to be perfect for your life, even though you may not understand it today. You'll understand it one day. How many of us have waited on the Lord and seen His blessing? Don't give up surrendering. I know it's sacrifice. I know you look out there in the world saying, well, they're not sacrificing, they're not surrendering, look at them. But you don't see all that they go through. You don't know that you need to quit looking all around you and look to Christ. Because he's got a blessing in store. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as you stand to your feet,